Welcome to MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Soccer Player Development Podcast. Discover all the secrets, hints and tips about soccer player development and soccer coaching from some of the leading figures in world soccer. Here's your host, Saul Isaacson Hurst. What's happening guys, Saul here back again and this week we've got a top, top guest. This guy is really one of the best in the world at what he does. It's Michel Roberto. He's a first team coach at Genk. Also used to work in the academy there as an individual specialist from nines all the way through to the uh, to the reserves. So he currently works with the first team, also does stuff with the uh, second reserve team and the 23. So really great insight into one of the best individual coaches in the world and what he does as a practitioner working uh, with the uh, pro players, but also in his work in the academy as well. So listen, there's not many individual coaching specialists I look up to, but this is definitely one of them. He's one of the best, like I say. So I've known Michelle for quite a long time. He did a bit for us uh, over lockdown on a webinar. Uh, just uh, so was waiting for, to get him back on the show and have a chat and have a chat to him. But like I say, if you're interested in, in uh, individual technical coaching or technical coaching as a team, this one is not to be missed. Like I say, one of the world's best. And don't forget, remember the My Personal Football Coach Level 2 e-learning course is out and we still have that uh, 20% discount code for a short time only, Level 2 podcast. Uh, go to mypersonalfootballcoach.com and coach coach and look at that coaching course because like it's the only place in the world, again, you're going to fight and learn about uh, 1v1 and ball mastery and session design, but specifically those 1v1 tactics that we hear so much about and um, which can be taught and uh, not just innate and ball mastery sessions and stuff like that. So check it out. Like I said, for a short time only, we have that 20% discount code. But without further ado, let's get into the show. So, Michelle Ribeiro, welcome to the show. Hi, how are you, so? Very well. Good to good to see you again. Good to chat. Obviously, we we had a, on the webinar because to get you on the on the podcast finally. I know you're a very busy man. Yeah. Gives a li- gives a brief description of your playing and coaching journey up to this point, Michelle. Uh, so I started playing football, of course, from the moment I was born. That's uh, that's that's something that uh, that happened a lot uh, with a lot of guys that love football. Um, I started playing professional at the age of uh, 16 and eight months. I make my debut in the first team of Gang. Um, then I went to Holland. I played a, a while for PSV Eindhoven. Then I played in uh, in Belgium second division. Then I went back to Holland to play in second division. Then I played in first division at Aston Bosch. I started uh, as a coach at the age of 28. I stopped playing professional uh, football uh, because uh, of injuries, just my knees and everything. So, so I had to stop uh, to playing at the highest level. So I played some futsal also a little bit. Uh, so at the age of 28, I started uh, as a coach here in Gang. I think that was in 2003, 2004. And uh, here still I am. So, uh, so good. I'm just, oh, but you, 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 did, you, did, you spell in America as well, right? You went to Kansas. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. For that. So I was two and a half years in, in Sporting Kansas City yeah. as a technical coach for the first team and for the academy. Okay, so so you so you started your you start your career in the academy at Genk, is that right? Yes, and then, I started uh, doing yeah. uh, the under seven until the under twenty three at that time. Yeah, okay, and then cool. four years later, four years later, I did the under seven until the twenty three, assistant coach of the under twenty three, and a technical coach from the first team. So Lovely. a lot of work, but good. Yeah, keep you busy. <laughs> ah, but it's good. It's good. Tell us about then your the transition. What was it like from transitioning from player to coach those initial you know sessions those initial that initial time to be very honest uh, I'm very lucky because they left me alone from the moment I started until now so I never went for courses I didn't read some books I just start at you know freelance in my head I went on the pitch I did my thing and now I'm like 19 years further still doing it still loving it so uh, fantastic and how did how did you come up how did you come up with sessions and your session design and things like that what how did you where did you pull that from your experiences at other clubs or what no 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 nothing for me it's just uh logical thinking right you know, it's bringing things to the pitch that uh, that you know players can use in the game you know from there on uh, i was always a, a skillful player you know so i saw some things that we can use from the streets you know to put it on the pitch and from there on, I start uh, perfectionizing my exercises, you know, and giving a little bit of, of everything, like the total package. Um, can you give us volleys, from, from volleys to 1v1 right. to 2v1s to opposed to unopposed. So everything, everything they need. So give us, can you give us an idea of some of those early days? You know, you're working, for example, seven, eight, nine year old. What, what do the sessions look for those guys? So basically, like everyone, a... everyone always gets the same footwork. 
from the right. under seven until the under 23, they all get the same footwork. And yeah. of course, it's it's harder um, for the under seven to start because everybody's always stuck. Yeah, we give them a little, the basic stuff. I always try to give them the, the hard stuff immediately when they are seven years old, you know? And then you see when they are eight, nine, 10, you know, they adapt so fast and you can go and do everything quicker and faster and, and with higher speed, with uh, uh, to be cleaner. I mean, so so it's it's all the same. So it's not, it's no different. The, the seven-year-old until the, I mean, even the first, the first team, of course, they have different aspects. You work more uh, position specific, uh, at older ages, but from from the early age on until the to the guys on the on the first team, they always have the same footwork. So, so give us an example. Of some of that footwork, what might that look like? Uh, it's combination work. I mean, combination work to be comfortable on the ball. It's it's uh, coordination work. It's combination. So it's doing three four skills in you know in one combo. Um, can they use it in the game? Of course, they will not use all four of them in uh, in one. But if you teach all four of them on one, they will use the one that they uh, they feel comfortable on, on the pitch. And, so, and, uh, and you mentioned coordination work. I mean, that's what I, I talk about that, you know, the, the importance of that movement development, developing those 1v1 movement patterns. Tell us a little bit me, about that. Me, yeah, for me, the coordination work that I give is player and ball. It's first of all, it's just uh, make players more mobile. The ankle work, the hip work, make them feel comfortable on the ball to have some supple, uh, you call it supple? Yeah, supple supple, knees, yeah. Supple ankles, yeah, you know, and then from there on, uh, you give them the combination. Um, and for me, that's a very important thing because the moment you're not comfortable on the ball, uh, you will have hard time, a hard time on the pitch, uh, to execute some, some, uh, some things you need to execute in a good way. If you make them comfortable on the ball, you will see you can, you can make them, you know, better on the ball, and and uh, things they have to decide on the game will be quicker faster because they can go both ways with both feet so can you give us an example how many skills are you teaching the players have you got like a bank or how many is it or is it just infinite I mean, just you know con you know different variations it's it's, it's uh, you know so it's it's a lot uh, you can go from 80 to 100 uh, skills and it's, it can look the same but it's also all, always with a with a different detail so it's a lot it's it's what is the skill i mean the skill for you is it's a different skill for me. It's a different skill for another coach. I have my my things in my head that I do, and I think it helps because I think we 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 develop some some good players here in gang. Uh, you still see on the pitch the guys doing some stuff that they learned here in the academy. So uh, so it's a it's 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 a great package of of skills. What what I get? It's not just one or two or three or four. It's perfect. Try to to perfectionize them and and a lot of skills. And movements. Tell us about then your initial time in the academy when you were working seven to the twenty threes. What what did your average working week look like? How how much access did you have to the players, and how do you divide your time up between well, all the players? For me, each age group, I have them at least one hour a week. I had them one hour a week for sure. And then the the, the team coaches, they, of course, they implement in a passing drill or uh, in a game form. They implement my movement that I teach the kids. So basically, technical work. It's every day. It's every day because the coaches, the, the team coaches, they, uh, I mean, they, they push the kids to use skills in the game, use skills in a passing in a passing drill, et cetera. So, so, but me personally, I had three to four sessions a day. So it's a lot, but but I mean, it's it's good. It's work. It's my passion. It's my love. So, can you give us an idea of what a typical session would look like? One of those hours. What? How do you break that up with each team? So we. Uh, so I do. So. Basically, the, the the teams they work from they, they train from four to six times in a week. Yeah. Uh, the technical work is forty five to one hour. First, I, first I start with uh, with ten minutes, just footwork, ball and footwork, mastering the ball. That's coordination, coordination and combination football. From there on, I'm gonna put it in a, in a type of passing drill, uh, ending with a one v one. With uh, just the finishing, without one v one, with a two v one, with a two v two, so it's 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 different. It's it's what I've seen. Sometimes with a chip, sometimes with a uh, with a volley, sometimes with a cross. So it depends what I what I see, what I think they need at the time. So then, how? So so, so you did ten minutes of that, and then then the passing drill, and then what? How long did this? And then last? I mean, and then the rest is just twenty to twenty five minutes. I go one way, twenty to twenty five minutes. I go the other way. So they have a. So I work in a mirror form, so they will do everything with both feet. 
Right. OK. And then tell us a bit about you talked about you, your, your 1v1s, your 2v1s and that sort of thing. Tell us a little bit about that and your structure and how do you create those environments? It depends. So first I start with a dry one with a 1v1 uh, line defending uh, for the kids to to learn when to do the 1v1, when to step in to do the 1v1, how to defend the 1v1. And then from there on, of course, they go in a, in a, in a different zone, in a square. Uh, then you go, you can do a 2v1, a 2v2 in a box. So it's, I mean, it's it's from different angles. So, I mean, it's everything, basically everything they need so in the game. Yeah, yeah. As I'm just saying, how do, how do you decide then? You know, for example, you having the under nines, you know, how do you decide what you're going to do in what week? Do you have like a structure you're working through for a season or you just, do you work the same stuff with all the age groups or how do, how do you organize yourself? Uh, it's things that I see in the game because yeah. I watch all the games and there are some, some thing, sometimes things that, that will come back in the game that I think, they are not good enough at it yet. And I will implement that in my in my in my training session. So basically it's very easy. If I see that that kids in in a week that I see that they really need more repetition to finishing drills uh in corners or whatever, I will put that exercise, I will end with that exercise in my uh, you know in my session. If I see they they need more 2v1s. I will implement that in my test. So it depends on what I see, what I what I feel they need they need in the game at that at that at that time. Interesting. And what about your thoughts in terms of you know academy football? Are you are you aiming to to challenge the players at the top? Are you aiming to support the players at the bottom? Or are you doing both? I mean, how do you always all you, of them? Always all, all of them. Yeah. It's very simple. Always all of them. Uh, we will never put our money on a talented kid at the age of 11, 12 years old. Uh, because I, as I told before uh, in some podcasts and some interviews, a top talent at 11 is not a top talent at 16, 17. You know, so kids at, ele at 11, 12, they are very naive. They cannot defend uh, very well at that time. So other kids are further in the head and playing football as, as other ones. Uh, other kids will pick up at older ages. So, uh, I mean, so it's, 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 it's different. I mean, it's different for me. But we will never put our money just on the top prospects at the age of 11, 12, because we believe in everyone. If you play at gang, we believe in every kid in, the, in our academy. That, that's very simple. So we put the amount of time in the, in the top talent at the age of, for example, at the age of 11 to a kid that is in, in the bottom of, the, of that age, qua talent, he will get the same amount of time as the other one. As the other one. So it's no problem. How do you manage maybe the differences at that time? So you might have, for example, you know, you're under you're under tens who have some players who are much more further along, some players who maybe who you think maybe need some more time. How do you manage those differences in your sessions to make sure everyone gets? You know, uh, we that? push them up. We push them up. We put them a year older. Uh, the very good ones, the very good ones, just come up and, and we put them a, little, a year older to challenge them a little more. Sometimes just two years older, and then of course you have kids that have. Maybe problems, I mean problems, like underdeveloped kids. Yeah, we, we give them a license to play with a year younger, so you will train with a year younger. And the moment that they are ready, you just push them up again. So, I mean, it's it's not difficult to handle that. What about defending? How much work do you do on individual defending? Me personally, I'm not a very good defender, so it's not my profession. So I will I will ask help from, from other coaches that are good at it. So I will ask, him, I will ask them to, to put a little time while my... My folks will be on the attacking. They will do the part of defending. So, I mean, it's just uh, it's just implementing that in, in my sessions and just ask for help to a coach that maybe is more is better in defending than I am. So it's, it's very easy to do that together. What, what about the academy in general? How much focus is put on out-of-possession work to in-possession work? Uh, I mean, of course, we always want to play good football. We always want to play dominant. We we want to be good in, in, in the attacking part, but also in the defending part. Of course, you need to know that the age of uh, the young guys, they need to play free and you need to let them adapt and help them where they need some help. But first of all, read, get, read how kids do it and then try to help them in, in every aspect. But we will never go and do a, a, a training session just in defending that that's a thing that we don't do no and and so you talked about like you doing the same stuff from the sevens up to the to the 21s is that always the case then there's never going to be much variation in the, in in the delivery you're going to have same 2v1s 1v1 work it is it is basically the same but it's just at, at, the, at another level <clears throat> i mean at another level and i mean with another level i mean uh, um the way they have to defend 
the detail of defending, the detail of attacking, um, the the amount of time that you have to 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 make a decision, the amount of time that you have to score a goal. So at the older ages, of course, you need to be faster. It needs to be much faster because you don't have that time in, in the game. And at the younger ages, you just let them play, let them play and see what they do and then try to help them uh, in, in all facets of the game. And what about doing, working on uh, trying to develop your weak side, your weak foot? How much work do you do on weak foot play and developing that side? The same, the same as a strong foot. The same as a strong foot. Of course, at the older ages, when, for example, we have a, a a new kid coming in at the age of 15, you see that our kids here, they are used to playing with both feet. If you see that he needs some extra stuff, of course, you take him out for, for 30 minutes, two times a week, and, and you work with that. I mean, and, and they will pick up anyway. And of course, it's also the coaches that they need to help them in the sessions uh, to use the weaker foot. And to let them make mistakes. So I mean, it's it's no problem here. It's no problem. We what about, and what about position specific stuff? When does that become important? I mean, do you do, for example, when you're working with the 15, 16s, are you you yeah. taking the wide players out as working specific one v one and those movements or the uh, defenders that sort of thing, or is everyone doing the same stuff? It's normally all the same stuff, but we will have always uh, in game situations from the team. We will always have them in one v ones in particular positions, and there we will encourage them to uh, to do one v ones to take players on and etc. So, I mean, it's not special that we take them out to do it because in the games and the training session we are always encouraging encouraging the player to to do the one v ones and take the players take players on in one v one always. Yeah, interesting. And tell us a bit about that then um, when you went to work in Kansas. How did that opportunity come about? Yeah, so Kansas, there were like a, a bunch, I think 100 coaches from the US, they came and, and see how we work here in uh, in Gank, because of course we had we have a good name in the world. Uh, we always have a pathway for young players. So they came and visited us to see the way uh, the way we work. And then the academy director at that time was, I think it was John Perry at that time. He, uh, he asked me if I was interested for a job in the US. So the first time I said no, and then two years later he contacted me again. So we had a we had a good meeting, and I was like, "Okay, let me see what uh, what I can do in the states." And that was a fantastic experience. Uh, big talents in in the U.S. So we had um, a good academy in Kansas City. So basically, we did everything we I try I did here in Gang. We tried to implement that in in Kansas. They uh, they helped me in all aspects to to do that and i think we did a good job over there so it was a it was a fantastic experience what were your first impressions what the what the main differences between working in in kansas and working in genk at the beginning it was hard uh, because we had to make some difficult choices and i mean difficult choices was to to cut kids that didn't have the level of um, of for example the elite you know and it depends. It's not uh, to kill the kids, but it's just if you want to make steps forward, uh, you need to have the best kids in the area of Kansas City and, and even further, you need to have them in your academy. So, and that was a, a hard uh, a hard thing to deal for for some coaches also. And uh, But at the end of the day, we did it. We, we cut some kids and we made the academy stronger by recruiting uh, kids from all of the US. They moved to Kansas City. So uh, that was the, the hardest thing to do and of course uh, to get everything and every coaches and players in the in the same direction. What what age group did they first start having the players there? Uh, under eleven. Under, under 11. eleven. Yeah. Under so 11. how how many players would they have in under elevens, for example, in Kansas? In Kansas, I think at the beginning they had also 18, 16 to eighteen. But to be honest, the quality of the of the the team, the selection was not that good. So we had to cut, for example. Eight and try to bring eight better ones in. How many how many players with the same age group have in Genk, for example? At Genk, we have at the age group of under eleven, we will have twenty to twenty four players. Right, and it, and just you just have, you'll have much higher level players at Genk, just consistency wise, just through really, the you think yes, just, um, more yes, volume. yes, because they uh, you know we bring them from all over in Belgium. Of course, Belgium is a small country. You know, uh, it's two hours away from from the border of France, for example. So you can go and get guys from Brussels, uh, and they are one hour away from gang. So it's easier for us to uh, to bring them in. And yes, there is there is a lot of of talent. I mean, a lot of potential in Belgium. So uh, so it's good working. How is it? How is it competing with other big Belgian teams? I mean, 
Belgian small countries, for example, Anderlecht and stuff, who are those, you know, more or less. So I think, I think we have our we have our way of uh, of working. We show that we develop fantastic players. Uh, we're still doing it. We have now in the first team all threes, all fours playing, uh, top talents, very young, get, getting the chances and uh, and playing. Um, so everybody in Belgium know, and I say that with a lot of respect to Anderlecht, to Bruges, and whatever. But we just have the best way of developing and and the best way of working is just in gang. Uh, sometimes Anderlecht will have a, a bigger talent than us, uh, but we make talent. I mean, mm. we make a good player. A very, very, very good player, and that's the thing we are we are known in, in, in all Europe. So, uh, so we don't look at Anderlecht, we don't look at Bruce. We have our way of working. They have their way of working. We know, and we showed in the past that we are good at it, and we just continue doing it. So until the day, until the day of the days. So tell us then, what is that way then? Can you just you know explain to us explicitly what is the the Genk methodology, which is so famous, or the way the Genk methodology? It's it's simple. It's all coaches, we have all our way of of, uh, of uh, thinking and the philosophy of the club. Everybody will do the same thing uh, in gang. It's not one coach playing this system, the other coach playing this system. Uh, this coach is asking uh, the players to play defensively, the other ones. No, we all have our same, our way of, of thinking. We work technically here in the academy, technically at a very high level. Uh, that's the, the, the most important thing that we have here. To make kids comfortable on the ball, and you know, all pull on the same court, the same string, you know. Yeah. So that's I think the key that we have here, and we can bring kids in from from everywhere because they know what we do and what we have done in the past. So I think that separates us from uh, from a lot of other clubs in Belgium and in the world. So give us an example. Then, if I was going to look, at, if I was going to watch a gang team at under nine or under fifteen, what am I? What sort of things am I going to see? You will see technical, very good players, small players, big players, but you will see they're all good, technical, developed. That's the thing that we look for. We look for the, like they say now, the smart player, kids that are good. They don't need to be just strong and and winning games. No, we just want to see them making good decisions on the ball, uh, have a good mindset, work ethic, you know. So we try to recruit them at a very young age and... uh, and yeah, that's that's the thing you will see. You will never see just uh, a team of gang just playing, for example, kick and rush or just defend to win a game. We will always play to play good football, to play a good football with, with possession, but not just possession to have possession, possession just to create to create some some one v ones, two v ones to score goals. You know, to play attractive football. That's the thing that you will hundred percent see when you come and watch our under seven play until the first team play. You will always see good football for sure. Do, 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 they, do the teams play of like a standard formation through the academy, or is it the, the coaches have free to do what they want? No, we always talk. We always talk. We always talk. We try to develop players in three, four positions, and of course, at the older ages, we go to two, three positions. But it's always in communication with the director and all together. We will. There will never be a coach that just gonna decide alone. I'm gonna do this and this with this player. It's always in communication with. But the coach, for example, the under 13 coach will have communication with the under 14, with the under 15, under 13 coach. And of course, with the director, with the technical coach. And from there on, we will talk and we will see what's the best for the for the individual. And from there on, we will see what the best project for the kid is. I mean, but do you, what, what formation will the team play? I'm just, do, you, do they play 4-3-3 through the academy or is it variation? Always. No, we always play 4-3-3 through the academy. Always. Uh, and why is that? Why do you like 4-3-3? Because we think that if you build them up and if you de- develop them in a 43, it's very easy to de- adapt in a 442 on a 352. So, uh, uh, to adapting them for, uh, to play in a 442 to a 433, for us, we saw in the past that, it's, that they had a harder time than if you develop them in a 43, going to a 442. I think it's, it's easier to develop. Yeah, interesting. And what about what? What do you have? Do the players come in? What t- what age are the players full time in the academy? Do you have like do you have housing there? Do players come and live there? Anything? On the seven, they're full time with us. We we don't bring kids in just for one time in a week or two time. They just come in, and if we bring guys in from 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 Brussels, for example, and it's uh, we don't want them to drive too much in the car and, and all that stuff. Uh, we have host families uh, that we can put them in. Uh, I mean, we have everything here, all the resources that we need. To have kids here full time in the, in the club, to 
work with them with, with videos. Uh, so we have everything here. I mean, so, so what? So what time? What? What? What's the youngest age a player will come and stay with the host family? With the host family, we try to do that at the under thirteen. Thirteen. Because at the under thirteen, it's when they go to high school. Yeah. You know, and they live in Brussels, for example. Uh, from that moment, we don't want to take them out of the of the, I mean, of the families and of the schools when they are at the age of nine. But if the possibility is there for both for the parents and the kid and us, we will bring them in at the age of eight, nine. So that's no problem for us. We will try to make it work. How far is Brussels from Genk? It's 45 one hour. So it's okay. It's, not far. it's okay. It's okay. And so, and so what gives a typical training week then of the under nines, the eights and nines, how often will they train? The under nine, they train four times a week, four okay. times for one hour and 45 minutes. Okay. And then one game as well. And one game, yes, yes, yes. Okay. And and when does what age does the training time increase? When does what age do you start doing more than four times a week? Um, on the thirteen, they go to to six times a week. Six times a week. Six times a week. They go from two two morning sessions, and uh, and you know, in combination, we have a good uh, collaboration with the school. So they go on uh, on two sessions in the morning and four sessions in the in the evening. So all the players thirteens will go to the same school. Not all of them. Some of them, they come from further away, but we will make sure that they, they will come earlier to catch up the extra work that they have to do. So, uh, so, but let me say 80%, 70%, 80% of the team, they will all, all to, they're all together in the, in the same school, in the same class, so it's easy for them to uh, to come so, to the club. So 13s to, to what age are doing six times a week, or is that to all the way to the 20, 21s? Uh, it's all the way to the 21, yes. And of so course, now the now the under twenty three they play second division. It's a professional, it's yeah. a professional team, so they will have the same amount of training session as the first team because sometimes they will have two games in the in the, in the week, but from the under eighteen to the under thirteen they all have six sessions a week. So, so give us an example then of a typical training week for an under thirteen or fourteen. What days you know? What, tell us like day by day. Uh, for example, it's Monday to Monday to Friday. It's at the evening, and then you still have. On Wednesday and uh, on Tuesday, they will have an extra training moment at uh, at eight thirty in the morning. So they do double sessions on. on they those do two double days. session, except that the session that they do in the morning is uh, it's in short and small groups, individual session, technical work. So just some extra extra work for the for the kids to to even be better on the ball than they are already. And then and then they'll play one game on the weekend, have one day off. Has that is that sort of structure? Friday. So normally it will be uh, sometimes they will have Friday off, sometimes on Sunday. So sometimes they at the at the young ages they still play some futsal sometimes. So it's a very busy schedule for them. But I mean, if you go to to uh, to the streets and you play in the streets, you have long days also. So yeah, yeah. And you, and you mentioned futsal. Is that is that a part of the program? There, a big part of the program? No, it's not a special part of the program. But at the young ages, uh, sometimes we uh, we let them play uh, futsal on Sunday, and it's basically some kids that that will come back or they are new in the club and they need some extra extra footwork, extra work to uh, to adapt. Sometimes they uh, they play futsal, but it's most most of the time from the under eight, from the under eleven down. Yeah, yeah. And it's and not it's not every week. It's not every week. And how much competitive football is a player getting from the under nines, tens, elevens, twelves? Are they playing competitive football every week? Is it? Is it every week. every week from the under eight? Every week they play competitive football. Always. So what, they that play in the league or something like a Belgian well, we league? Play, of course, yeah. We play. Uh, sometimes we play regional games, but against teams that are a year or two older. But we right. also play, for example, under like a few times we play PSV Eindhoven. So we always have big tournaments and. Against Mütter Gladbach, Bayer Leverkusen, Bayern Munich, uh, Chelsea. So we play, we play them all in big tournaments. But every game is, comp I mean, every week it's competitive games against, sorry, good opponents. Interesting. Yeah. I'm, I'm just wondering. So, but like, I mean, yeah, but like for example, in England, the academy games system is friendlies. You only play friendlies, and then you play some competitive fixtures. Is that the same in Belgium, or do you that's, play like? Yeah, no, that's the same as us. We we don't have. I mean, we don't have a, a, a table. A table at the age of uh, under 12 down. I mean, we don't do that to play champion. From the under 13 up, yes, under 12 is just competition game, but it's not like playing champion. We don't have a, a standings or, or whatever. We don't have that. We don't, we don't use that. We don't yeah. use that. Just from the under 13 up. Interesting. And it's a bit about Kevin De Bruyne, who's obviously, you know, well documented. He's one of your academy graduates. Yeah. Do you remember him? What sort of player was he when he first came in? And 
Did you was he known? Did you think he was going to be one of the best players in the world? No, 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 no. We thought he would be a, become a professional football player because Kevin was he was just a good player. He saw things that other kids didn't see at his age. Also, uh, it was not that he was a player that uh, I mean that killed the game every every week. But you saw that he had special tools. I mean, he was left and right footed perfectly. He was a very smart player. Uh, he was a player with opinion, with his opinion. So he always was a guy that uh, could interact and could discuss with the coach. So that was lovely to see. Um, but that he will become the player that he is now, I mean, nobody can... can. I could imagine that. We are very proud that he was here. I'm very proud that I worked with, with him for four or five years. Fantastic for me to see where he is now. But he was a good player, but he was not a standout at the age of 14. But just a very good player, like like we like we have a lot of players here. What, what age did he come into the academy? Uh, Kevin came at the age of under 14. Under 14? Yes. So, I mean, and, tried, and, and at, to be honest, at the age of 16, he was 16 and a half. Over there, you started, he, he was getting stronger, better. Um, yeah. And then he played a, a second team game in Kortrijk. I will never forget that. Uh, we put him in, in second half. He came in, he scored five goals. And mm -hmm. from that moment on, he really exploded. He really exploded. He went to the first team at the age of 17 and he just keep kept growing and, and you know, and the rest is just history. Yeah, because you mentioned earlier, like, you know, you say the, the top talents at 11 aren't the top talents at 16. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more of that because people may be surprised. You may, you know, how do you, you know, or do you have sometimes, you know, the outlier at nine who's always the outlier still, at, you know, going into the, to the no, youth I don't team? Agree with, I don't agree with that because, you know, I'm, I'm now 19 years doing this job. And I saw a lot of kids at the age of 11, they were unbelievable and fantastic. And, and just, yeah, they were just, I mean, phenomenal, you know. And then I, I, I kept following them up. And then at the age of 16, you saw that other kids became stronger, also faster, and they had a harder time, you know. And then if you're mentally not that strong, then you will drop. So you need to make sure, even if you're a top talent at the age of 11, 10, 12, that you need to keep stepping up and making, I mean, making progress all the time. It's never done working. Never, never, never. For example, you see now um, um, Musonda, Charlie uh, Musonda. Yeah. He was at the age of 12, 13. He was, I mean, unbelievable. I mean, he was mm -hmm. just fantastic. And then you saw when he was getting older, uh, he was still good. But at the age of 17, 18, he was having a harder time. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, I still believe in him, but he's, I think he's 25, 26 now, mm -hmm. and he still didn't manage, manage to, to, I mean, to kill it, and and not even not Vitesse, not not in Spain, you know. So it's not just being a top talent at 11 that you will become a, 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 a top professional football player. That's but just not I, the case. I, I mean, I remember Charlie from Chelsea though. Even you know, as a 17, 18 year old, a top top talent, and everyone still thought, yeah. you know, yeah. what what I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because there's such a fine line between making it and not making it. You know, in terms of, you know, sometimes things click into place and those sorts of things. I mean, what can players do, I suppose, to make sure that they have the best chance of going all the way? Yeah, but also, you know what it is all. You can be uh, smart, you can be technically very good, but you need to be able to run, to fight, yeah. you know, to fight, uh, to to help the team in other aspects when you're a professional. It's not just, you know, in the academy, uh, you can make a lot of mistakes and, uh, you know, people will see the good things that you do and not too much the bad things you know of course in the first team it's the opposite they will look at the bad things you do because mm. if you lose a ball uh, in a certain area and you lose a game in the first team you know you can you can lose a title you can lose a lot of money you can use uh, you can lose um, for example uh, a semi final in the champions league you know it's all details so and and they don't give you the time for that so you need to be ready uh, at a at an age at a certain age you need to be ready and and see that you can help the team in all aspects not just in possession you need to work back you need to fight you need to tackle you, they need everything so i think in in, in those areas um, there are a lot of top potential kids at a young age they never did this they never needed to do it and then they come to a first team they need to do it and they are never learned or teach to do that by the coaches and then they will drop they will have a hard time to uh, you know, to adapt. What can we do then as player developers to help players like that? How, what can we do in terms of our program? As I say, uh, as I said before, you know, people always 
they they i think people don't take it serious but you need to give them the total package you need to give them everything i mean if you know that they need to become stronger uh then you need to do something at his body at the older age not at the younger ages if you see that he's good with his feet but he's not good at stealing balls then you need to work with him and stealing balls you need to uh, tell him you need to be better at this or this or this and it's not just uh, uh, to do it individually you can do it in a team session you can do it in a game at a young age so you, they need everything they need everything you need to build a kit in the in the academy and you need to have a program in the academy and the program i need uh, the philosophy to to build a, a, a player that one day hopefully will play professional in the first team. So you need to make him total. You need to make him, if he's not fast and running, you need to make him fast in the head. Mm. You know, yeah. uh, if you need that, if you see that he's very strong in, in the in the one v ones, but he's not very strong in, in the eleven v eleven and the tactics, then you need him. You need to make him better in the tactics. Otherwise, he will not make it. So you need to to develop a player in, in all aspects, even in the academy. But of course, it start with being good on the ball. That's where it starts. But if you're not good on the ball, then you can be very smart. You can be very fast. If you're not good with your feet, you will never make it. Because we always say, uh, uh, of course, you need to have the brain. Of course, you need to have the brain. But if you don't have the feet and the brain, you will never make it. You need mm -hmm. both. It's easier, for, it's easier for a player to have feet, decent feet, to become professional, than to have very good brain and have no feet. Mm. Because the coach will, at the end of the day, if you cannot execute some things with your feet in the game, the coach will say, he's a smart player, but he's worthless because he cannot execute the things that I want him to execute. How so you, do you try to do everything with him. How, how, do you, how, do you, how does that work then in practice in the academy? Do players have individual plans? Do you have individual meetings with players? So you might say, identify an under 14, hey, look, Tactically, this is what we're trying to work on. Yes. This is your plan for the mix. How, how, tell us a bit about that process. We do that here with all ages. I mean, we do, of course, not with the under eight. Uh, but I think from the under 10 up, uh, we show the kids, we show the kids some, some, some videos, what they do in the games. So if they recognize some decision that they made, if they recognize uh, what they have to do in ball position, what they have to do in, in, you know, when, when we don't have the ball. And it's not going very deep in it. It's just to show some little details to see if the kid understands. If he understands it, it's perfectly. If he don't understand, then we will go and work with it. And we will go and work with it on the pitch because we want, it's easy to do it like with, with magnets and everything. But the best way to do it is just on the pitch, stopping a training session, just one little, a few seconds and just to help the kids to, to teach them why, 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 where he needs to run and why he needs to run over there. So it's just, it's, it's easy to do it, but you need to be open and you need to be patient to do it. And that's the thing that, I mean, we do it here all together. So it's, it's, it's good working. Now, how does, how does, it, does, is there a process behind that though, in terms of, you know, it player, you know, player A has a plan for the, you know, an individual plan with, you know, for example, in England, a lot of clubs have individual plan player plans where you have three targets for the month or for the year or something like that. Is it, or is it a bit more sort of you just work for each player each time, that sort of thing? For me, we have an individual plan for all players. And right. an individual plan, I want to say, we don't go and we say, this player need this. We try just to do in every session that we have and every uh, weekly planning that we have, we try to um, to work with the kids to give them everything they need. I mean, everything they need. It's not just, okay, you need this and we're going to focus just on this. We just need to make sure as coaches that we have everything in our training session. That's the most important thing that we that we work on and, uh, as a coach because you can promise a lot of things uh, to a kid individual, but at the end of the day, they need to be good in the team. Mm -hmm. We work for the individual, but they need to be good for the team as well because that's the thing that we want them to be in the first team. Tell us about that planning process and how does that work? The, the, you know do you sit down i mean how do, how do you tie in with the planning process because you have to work across it at that time you worked across all the teams yeah do it does each team meet does a phase meet a group of teams meet are you how do you 
how do you tie in with that? No, we uh, we just sit down. I mean, every week we sit down with the coaches. You know, we sit down with the coaches. We have the program. This is going to happen now because, for example, if we have a game on Wednesday, the sessions will be maybe a little I, not different, but the timing will be will be different. But we just sit down. Uh, we talk about uh, certain uh, certain details that we saw in the game, and from there on, we we make a schedule. We make an, an exercise, and 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 that's how we, that's how we do it. I mean, it's nothing special. It's just the things that we do and, and, and the thing that we that we believe that they that they need. But I mean, so I mean, each team will sit down or the, all the coaches from all the teams no, sit no, down no, together? No, no. Or... no, we sit together with all the coaches because we right. all, we don't have the same exercises, but everyone knows uh, the focus this week or the coming two weeks will be, will be this. It will be more uh, in this part of the of the in the build up, for example, and that's what they do in the training session. But regardless, the build up and the training session, uh, we do everything. I mean, it's not that we don't do uh, every week two v twos, two v ones, one v ones. I mean, we do everything. We try to give to give everything the whole week. I mean, Monday you can do this, Tuesday you can do this, Wednesday you have the technical training. Uh, you can work individual with some players. So I mean, it's it's I mean it's it's a whole. I mean, it's all balloon that we do, mm. that we that we present, and 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 we just we just do that weekly. And so, tell us about then your current role. You're working with the first team, also the uh, the 23s and the 18s. That's correct, right? Or the second I'm, team? No, and no, I'm I'm just working with the first team, right? Uh, with the second team, that's the B team that plays, and with the under 18. Yeah, with and the under 18. Son, and my son is the technical coach from the under 16 to the right. seven but the the met methodology is exactly the same as yes. as mine so, so yes so, so 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 tell us about them what did, what's your average working week how do you split yourself between the first team the b team and the a teams uh me i do normally i will be two times a week i will i will work with the with the first team except yeah. of course if the if the head coach want me one extra time uh with the first team then i will have two three moments with the second team and two three moments with the with the on the 18 and of course I watch all games. Uh, I see the games. I talk with kids. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's it's a lot of work. So tell us then those two sessions you had with the first team. What would they look like? Uh, it depends. It depends. It's a technical session, but of course, it's more uh, individual and uh, specific from position. Um, it's for example with the strikers in the midfield. It's just finding you know finding pockets, uh, doing press turns, uh, giving a good ball through. Um, uh, doing the, working on the assist on chip balls, and of course with the strikers is is doing finishing from from all areas. I mean, uh, from the from the, coming from the right side, from the left side, central, uh, in the box, out of the box. So so I mean, uh, finishing drill with the head volleys. It's 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 total. I mean, it's everything. Do you do footwork with the whole team? Is it the group? Everybody does yes. the footwork. Yes, we do footwork. Like like once in a week, we do the combination and the, and the coordination, and every, everyone will get that. I mean, even for the first team until until the young guys, they all all will have that one or twice a week. And yeah. so, how long would that how long would that session be? That, that... this is uh, this is maybe like fifteen to twenty minutes. It just yeah. ball mastery, just to get comfortable on the ball. And yeah, it's like a type of a second warm up. Easy, just to be comfortable on the ball and give them some repetitions. Yeah, yeah, and and what is what is how do the players react to that? Because obviously, maybe some players never done that sort of stuff before. Of course, the guys that the, the guys that never done that before, it's, it's it's hard for them in the beginning because I have a lot of hard exercises, uh, so it's hard for them in the beginning. And of course, the weaker foot of them, it's not developed a lot mm. of time like the ones that 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 we developed here. So they will have a hard time in the beginning, but after this, like I mean, like after one or two months, they will adapt easily. And it's for them just like like brushing your teeth and it's nothing special anymore. How does are there are times where maybe the coach will call you in and say, look, for example, the fullback is struggling to work with one v one moments or receiving aerial stuff yeah. like that. How's that yes. how does that work? Yes. So if we sit together and, and we see that in a player in the game, for example, uh, a center back or a number six uh, defensive midfielder that we see that he's always turning to his right foot because his left foot is not well developed. Then we take him out for thirty minutes and I go and work with him. But it's always in, in uh, you know in communication with the head coach. How much how much room do you think is there for development with experienced professionals in you know 27, 28, 30, 32 years old? Always, always. I work with guys from from thirty two. If you repeat, if you repeat and re and do repetition, they will always learn. 
at no matter what age, no matter what age they are, they will always learn. Of course, you need to have the time with them to do it and the player needs to be open to learn. So, um, so, uh, so that's what I'm interested in. So you talked about that, for example, a number six who can't open up onto their weak side. How much time does that take and how much time can you have in a busy first team schedule? Yeah, if you do this, if you do this uh, like 20 minutes, two times a week or 15 to 20 minutes, two times a week, like 30 balls, it's enough. I mean, it's enough. And I'm 100% sure that after, after one week in the game, of course, you need to speak with the player that he need to be, I mean, that he need to do it in the game, that he don't need to be afraid to make a mistake. Uh, and you will see, and even in training session, that you will push him to use his, his left foot or right foot or his weaker foot, like you call it. Um, then you will see that he will he will adapt and he will do it in the game for sure, hundred percent. And and what sort of what other sort of stuff are you doing with those players? You doing like ball striking exercises, different variations, and those sorts of things. Everything they need. I mean, for midfielders, if they have to do uh, if they have to open up with the left or right to do cross passing, to do chips. Uh, then we do everything with, with left and right foot. If you see, uh, for example, uh, a right winger, yeah, of course you go doing crosses, right winger, but coming inside and finishing with his left foot. So it's everything basically they need in the game. Would you say that, you know, the stuff you're doing is very similar to what you'd work with even the seven, eights, nine, tens, 11 year olds, the same sort of stuff? I'm talking about the ball mastery, yeah? Yeah, the ball, ball mastery, those yeah, principles. Ball mastery is all the same, yes, of course. Yeah. All the same. All the same. Because a lot of people may think that's unusual, you know, you're doing that stuff with the with older players. Tell us a bit why. What are the main principles you're trying to well, get out there? The, the I think the if the people see me work with the first team, then they will say it's unusual for me to do it with the under seven. Mm. It's not opposite. People always see ah, the he's doing the guy the, the work from the under seven. He's doing the same with the first team. No, it's the opposite. It's mm. the opposite. You need. To, see that I'm doing work with the under seven exactly the same as what I'm doing with the first team. This is how you need to see it. Yeah. So, and I want to bring this kid from seven, eight, nine, ten years old to the level of the first team. Yeah. So what do we need to do? We need to make it as at the beginning maybe complex, but you will see after two, three weeks, they will fly and they will they will have no problem at all to to learn it because uh, kids kids are like sponges. They 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 learn very fast, easily. And what, how do you develop yourself? How do you keep yourself at the top of the game? Being on the pitch every day. Being on the pitch, playing with the guys. Uh, like sometimes I, I still do some training session with the first team. Sometimes they, they, they need an extra player. And me and myself and my and me and my son, we go, I mean, we go on the pitch. We always thinking about some new stuff and we practice it because you need to, you need to be ahead of it, of, ahead of the kids and you need to show it in the correct way. It's not just, uh, showing them a video it's teaching them in a correct way and showing them the detail why you do it uh, how you do it so it's a lot of work but as as, as you, if you love it it's no problem for you to do it and and i mean what do you think i mean obviously we have this conversation regularly and there's a, there's 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 two there's what well, is there's several different schools of thought and coaching a big school of thought who maybe talk about you know the unopposed work not having any benefit or transferring into 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 game situations what would you say to those young coaches who've been influenced by those sorts of people talking about that if i have to talk with them i'm 100% sure all of them they do on opposed work all of them it's no chance that they don't do on opposed work during a week if you do a warm up without ball you're doing on opposed work mm. if you do a passing drill you're doing on opposed work if you play um, a game, you're doing work with pressure, under pressure. But there is no chance that there is a coach that do a warm-up without unopposed work. There is no coach that do a passing drill without unopposed work. You can never do a finishing drill always with opposed work. So all the coaches that say we don't use unopposed work, to be very honest, I don't believe that at all. all well, I, think, I think I mean I would think there are extremists out there. But my question would be when do they get to work on those individual techniques and develop those techniques? If everything's in the game, everything's done in that chaos, when do you get to learn new things, break things down, really refine course, things, right? If a kid is not comfortable on the ball, how can you teach them things under pressure, moves, skills under pressure? if they are not good on the ball yet. 
first you need to do it and teach them on a post. And then you can put a little pressure and then you can put it in a game situation. So they need everything. Otherwise they will get unclean on the ball. They will be sloppy. And what happened with those kids? The same guys, the same coaches that say, I don't work on a post. They will cut the kid because he's not comfortable on the ball. Mm. And they will lose the game and he will be pissed at the same kid because he's now he's not doing on a post work. So first you need to teach the kids how to be good and comfortable on the ball, left and right foot first. And then you can go and do a pose work. But every week you will have game and or you will have uh, training sessions on a pose. No matter what coach, young coach, old coaches that are saying now, we don't work on a post, they all do it. They all do it. Because every time I ask a guy, please just answer my question, yes or no. If I ask a question, they will never go into it because they all know they will go with their face against the wall because they all do it. All of them, they do. And what about, I mean, that's the other thing they say, they say, oh, when you, you know, you work with this ball mastery program, what you're doing is you're stunting creativity. I mean, you, you talked about it earlier. How, tell us why, you know, when you're developing that quality on the ball that actually leads to better creativity and better decision-making. Yeah. Why? It's, it's very simple because you need it in the game. Everybody wants to develop good players. So the good player, they need to have, they need to have that those type of, of, of sessions. They need to get better at everything. They need to be better in a 1v1. Because in the game, if you create a 1v1 and you dribble and you of or you win the 1v1s against your opponent, you will have somewhere else on the pitch another free player. So you're playing with a, a, a we call it the overtall. So you need that. And as, even if it's defensively, if you win a 1v1 defensively, oh, cool, okay, good. One guy is out of the of the pitch and you got another one. I mean, you got another one free elsewhere on the pitch. So you need to work on that. You need to work on that. They need it. You know, I get a little bit, and, and as, I, as I told you, on, of, as I posted on Twitter, I read, I read a lot of crap. Yes, I do that. Because are you telling me now or are those Young coaches or whatever they are, are they telling me or are they telling us guys with a little bit of experience that a guy like, for example, uh, Pep Guardiola uh, at Barcelona or at uh, at Man City playing with the biggest stars doing unopposed work? If you tell me that, that um, for example, Papain Landers now at Liverpool and Jurgen Klopp do finishing drills unopposed in a box with five balls, not even one defender, just Finishing, hitting those goals, those balls. Why do you think they do it? I mean, you really think they do it because it's fun? No, it's because the guys need repetition. So those young coaches basically are saying the top guys in the world, like Klopp, like Guardiola, they're not working in the correct way because they are working on a post. They're doing a passing drill on a post. They're doing a finishing on a post. I mean, so that's that's crap. That that that's not true. They are they are wrong. Yeah, and I, you know, now I had this conversation with a young coach, you know, even today or yesterday, same thing, I, you know, who they question. I say, well, why don't you go and look at environments? Go to, like, say, Genk, have a look at this academy, which has a culture, a methodology, a philosophy, but also proven, you, you know, the way your players play. You know, I say there's academies, you know, Arsenal here, if we very much ball mastery focus now and QPR, you can go and watch those games and you see the creativity of the players. It's better than other teams because like you say, you're giving them access to higher level decision-making and they have the freedom because they have control of the ball. But it's frustrating. Yeah. I don't see why these young coaches, why they, 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 they deny it. They could actually go and see, rather than speaking in theory, they could go and have a look at it in practice. It's, you know, it's not like it's a hidden away. So if, for me, it's always like this. So for example, if you train on a post and you train with a kid in a finishing drill. So for example, a striker on the 14. And we take them out and we say, okay, listen, his weaker foot is not good enough. So we're going to do some repetitions on his left foot. And you do it on a post, just finishing without a problem. If you don't do that, and in the game, the same coaches that are saying that on a post work is not good. If the kid will miss a chance, you know, big chance in front of the goal, trying to use his weaker foot and he will miss that chance, the same coach that are saying that on a post work is not good, he will get pissed at the same kid. So first you need to work on the kid uh, with the kid on a post to get better. And they don't need to think that 
individual coaches are selfish and they no, it's just to make kids better. It's just to make kids better. It's it's very simple. So, for example, if the same coaches, they go on and drive a car at the age of 18 or 17, they go for a license. The first time, where do they go? They go in a parking lot without cars. Without cars, because they need to learn to drive a car. So first, they need to learn to drive a car, and they go to an empty spot where they can do nothing, but they can not go and bump against another car. And then, of course, if they get better at it, then they go for the license and they go and drive on the street. It's the same. It's exactly the same. On opposed work is just to make kids better, to help the team coaches and to help the kids to win games, to be better on the ball and to be better on the team. That's the only thing they need to they need to look at it. But I think, to be honest, that a lot of those coaches, they are talking about on opposed work because they don't know the meaning of on opposed and they don't know mm. The, the 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 value of on opposed work they just don't know that, that that's very simple but they, because they are not good at it yeah i think you hit the nail on the head it's exactly the point they just they don't know how to do it properly or they haven't seen it done properly or they haven't seen the value in it because they don't you know they maybe associate it with something which you know is is not productive and that's where we have to try and educate coaches right so are they saying that for example i work with uh, maybe the best in the world at the moment, Kevin De Bruyne. I work with Origi, I work with Yannick Carrasco, uh, Benteke, I work with a lot of those guys, individual and unopposed. So why are those guys at this moment one of the best in the world? It's, it's because they had a lot of repetitions, not because of me, it's because of the club and the way we develop the, the pathway that we have here in gang, the philosophy that we have here in gang. So there must be something good that we are doing here in gang, that those guys, uh, we have 11 players in the national team of Belgium, 11 players that come out of the academy of gang, doing a lot of unopposed work, dribbling cones, finishing in small goals without pressure, Something has to be good. Something has to be good what we do here. And then, yeah. guys, and then guys that that never develop nobody. I mean, nothing. They never they only see those guys on tel television. Mm. They are saying to to basically to Guardiola and to this guy and to this guy, uh, uh, yeah, it's it's not good to work on a post. I mean, come on, are you are you are you serious? Do you have the same conversations in Belgium? Is it the same thing? I mean, what's, nope. what are the coaching courses like? Are the coaching nope. courses very much technical uh, based? So I don't want to be arrogant, but I don't go to uh, right. I don't go to those courses. <laughs> right. Okay. I, I, but I mean, I, but I mean, but culturally, I mean, what's it you know like? I mean, the coaches normally focus on technique over there. Yeah. They, listen, we don't care what the other coaches do. Right. Our coaches here, they know what we need to do to develop good players. We have our way of developing. So they can go to courses and they can do everything they, they do over there. And they can listen as long as they don't do everything they learn over there. Because we know what we do helped in the past and is still helping us now and it will help us in the future. So do your course, do everything you need to do. But when the coaches are here, they will work the way we as a club want them to work in our philosophy. And if they don't feel good at it they have to go to another club so how how often do you have like um coaches training days and stuff like that then how important is that sort of keeping us coaches up skilled no we don't have we don't have too much uh coaching days it's just when i'm for example when i'm doing a technical uh session the coaches are there with me so they assist me so i just ask them can you look at this detail i look at this detail so they help me so they they see everything i do mm. um, and if they have something that if they have questions, you know, we discuss it, we talk about it, and we try to get to get out of it as strong as possible together. But again, in the philosophy of the club. Interesting. Are there any other footballing cultures you you see that or clubs that you admire and think you know they have a good philosophy? We like them. You play them. You see similarities maybe with your own. I think um, yeah, for me, Ajax. Yeah, Ajax. But I think we do a, we do a very very good job because we play them every year and um, with the academy and we're not less than them so it's so that's that's very good to see and we do that with the less more money than than Ajax do um, a lot of people they always talk that Ajax 
develop good players. Of course, they develop good players, but they don't do different than us because uh, they buy a lot of players. Mm -hmm. The first team of Ajax, maybe they have two academy players and the rest are all players, 25, 28, that they buy. So they need to win games yeah. and to make it to the next stage of, of the Champions League. So I admire uh, Ajax a lot, the way they play, but I always do that. Um, I think... Uh, That I, I'm, I'm now I'm talking about really admiring that that sometimes I see Bayern Munich in the younger ages, the age of 13, 14, and I'm talking uh, and I, I, particularly the day that that uh, Mehmet Scholl was coach from the under 13, 14. Uh, I see them playing good football against us. I mean, really two good teams mm. uh, playing against each other, and then of course uh, you you will have teams that have different ways of playing, but also. Um, for example, Sporting Lisbon, mm. they play a little bit physical now, but also with, with a combination with uh, with some technical and Benfica. They, yeah. uh, I like to see them play also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are the teams that if we play them, that I say, ah, it's nice to see. I mean, it's nice to see. Then you play two teams against each other with, I mean, with really good football. And of course, sometimes teams from uh, playing out of uh, Japan, from Japan sometimes, yeah. What, what's, what's, what have been your impressions about English teams, English academies? Um, I think it's overall good. I think it's overall good, but I still see um, winning teams. I still see winning, I mean, doing everything to win a game. And it's good to do it, but uh, for me, it's a problem to do it um, at the cost of uh, of the, the, the way you play, you know? Mm. And... So, for example, a few years and now I'm talking about five, six years ago, we played the Champions League, uh, um, Premier League tournament, and I think it was in I don't know if it was in Tottenham, and we played Liverpool, and Liverpool had a very good winger, a very good winger, really, and we also had a very good winger, fast one, and the coach of Liverpool he put his winger on the left back position just to try to take our player out, mm. you know, and that was for me very strange. And I also talked with him after the game about it because I thought if he left his left winger on his position, I think we will have lost the game uh, because he was very good. And But he didn't do that. So uh, he put his very good left winger against our against our right winger. So, But our right winger was also good. So we won the game, but it's not about the way... Uh, uh, it's not about the winning the game, but that was just a thing that, that we here will never do that. We will never mm. put our best winger in the back just to try to 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 win the duels against another fast player, you know? Yeah, yeah. And what about yourself? What's your your, your own ambitions? I mean, you know, is this your job? You want to stay here for the rest of your life or is there other things you want to do? <laughs> yes, yes. Because uh, I was asked to um, to go with some some head coaches that, that were here in the gang. They are now playing, uh, they are now coaching and some other teams playing Champions League. Um, they asked me to go with them as an assistant coach. But I passed for that. If they called me to go and be the technical coach, individual coach, maybe maybe mm. I will reconsider that. Uh, I don't think so because I'm very good where I am now. Um, and I love it here. But for me, there is only one ambition. is just to, to keep developing and keep helping developing uh, some, some good, very good quality players. And what advice would you give to a young coach who wants to have a career in the game like yourself? Yeah, just be hunger, you know, be hungry to, to get better. You know, don't just uh, don't just think about one thing and, and be open for other things, but also, but never, never tell anyone if you're good um, to tell them what you need to do, you know. Of course, or maybe you need to be some that is, someone that is very good at his profession and you want to learn from him. Then you can you can you know, I mean you have you can have good discussions, but uh, just believe in yourself and and work hard and uh, let the guys, the players, uh, as long as they love you, you're doing a good job. Michelle, thank you very much. Been fantastic. Thank you, man. Thank you, man. <laughs>